Welcome to the last module in the Mid-Level Leaders in the Transition to Value program. We hope that since last time you've had some time to learn more about the financial aspect of the transition to value in your facility and have been able to reflect on how you and your department contribute. In the last module in this series, we're looking to the future by focusing on talent development. We'll talk about the role that talent development plays in the sustainability of your organization and in the successful transition to value. We'll help you think about ways to hire and promote employees with an eye on future needs and develop your team's skills and knowledge in meaningful ways. And like in every module, you'll hear other hospital leaders share their perspectives on these topics. And we'll leave you with a few things to explore further on your own and with others. So let's get started. Talent development can be defined as efforts that foster employee learning and growth. When done well, these efforts increase employee engagement and ultimately improve the organization's bottom line results. Whether your organization has its own training and development staff or not, as a leader, you are ultimately responsible for ensuring that the people who report to you have the knowledge and skills not only so that they can succeed right now, but also to ensure that the organization succeeds in the future. Talent development responsibilities include things like making hiring decisions with an eye on future needs, succession planning, delegating, and coaching. Talent development really starts with the hiring process. According to the Center for Creative Leadership, the most effective healthcare leaders make hiring decisions based not on the type of people who have been successful in similar roles in the past, but based on the skills, knowledge, and traits needed to move the organization forward in the new healthcare environment. Not only do new hires need up-to-date technical skills related to their area of expertise, they also need to be able to collaborate with others, continually seek out learning opportunities, and skillfully deal with an ever-changing environment. Before filling a vacant position, we encourage you to think about what will be needed in that position three to five years down the road and make hiring decisions accordingly. As my leaders actually hire individuals, they have to look for not only the skill set, but the right individual. And a lot of times my phrase is harp for the personality and train the skill. And that's even more important today because that individual has to be flexible. They can't, we can't hire individuals to, to fit into a box or a role that we're hiring them into today. They have to be able to be flexible and adaptable for future needs. Certainly communication. They have to be able to communicate. They have to have a new way of thinking because certainly the always doing things the same way that we've always done them is not the answer today because things are changing so rapidly. We always have to be looking at what's new and what we, we can do differently. Well, in the hiring process at Tri-County, one of the, uh, the mantras that we've adopted the last several years is we not only are looking to hire for the current position, but also for the next position that that individual may be uh, ready or willing to serve. So looking uh, to, to find folks who have the ability to grow and have the ability to take on more challenges. Um, so we're, we're uh, looking at motivational and behavioral interviewing tactics, uh, folks who are connected to our values, uh, have appreciation for our vision and the mission of the organization. Um, we want our mid-level leaders to be able to help uh, find those people and then groom them to maybe in some cases even leave their department, which sounds counterintuitive at times, but that's what's best for the organization. Um, we are looking for our leaders to uh, help people grow beyond uh, what their current role is so that uh, the value that they can bring to the organization is enhanced through that ability to, to do more and take on uh, uh, growth opportunities and more challenges. Hiring is tricky. You want to go with your gut. Um, sometimes your gut's not always right. So we also do a peer panel interview, um, which I found all but one case that I've agreed with everything that they've said. So I really suggest the peer panel interview, but the supervisor still has the final say. Um, so that really helps with hiring the right type of person. You still have to, to make sure you got the, the right skill of person. And then once you get them in, it's really important to just be with them as much as possible. Assign them a mentor when you can't be there with them every day. Um, check up with them every couple of days if you're not working side by side with them. 
And then I also like to send them a thank you note after the first two weeks, you know, just thanking them for, you know, being on our team, being with us and just constantly recognizing the little things that they're progressing. I noticed that the more you recognize somebody, especially in the beginning, it seems like the faster they seem to catch on. So, and you know, then once you do that, you're recognizing people all the time, it just becomes a habit. I think it's interesting because over the last week, actually, we have, I've done some rounding with each of my employees individually, and it's kind of funny. They, they come into my office and they're like, well, why are we talking or what are we meeting about? And they're like, we talk to you all the time and you, you're always popping in and you're always saying things. And I said, yeah, that's fine. But I think it's nice to be able to have an individual conversation with them in a private setting so that we can talk about, um, you know, things that they maybe haven't really thought about before or, you know, my a lot of my employees are, are younger and they have kids and, you know, they aren't they aren't always thinking about how they may be able to contribute in their work um, environment in the future. Succession planning is the process of proactively preparing for continuity and growth when a position is vacated. In particular, you might want to think about developing successors for positions in your area that require key knowledge or skills and leadership roles including your own. A well thought out succession plan can significantly reduce cost and shorten the time span between one person's departure and their successor being identified and trained. Effective succession plans can help ensure continuity of processes and projects within your department, and even more importantly, improve employee engagement and retention. As an example, imagine that you lead a department responsible for coding and billing. You have one employee with unparalleled expertise in coding and you know that if that person left their position, coding accuracy would drop, likely resulting in reduced revenue for the hospital. If you have a succession plan in place, however, where you've focused on ensuring that one or more other employees have been able to develop their knowledge and skills in the event that your coding expert did leave, the hospital in your department is much better positioned for continued success. And as we mentioned earlier, we strongly encourage you to think about a plan for your own successor as well. A secret that not all leaders know is that your own career growth often depends on having someone prepared to step into your shoes should the opportunity arise for you to move up. Do you know who might be able to take on your leadership role if you were to be promoted? If not, we encourage you to think about this and create a plan for developing the skills and knowledge of one or more people who could potentially fill your role. Another way to think strategically and proactively about talent development is by engaging in STAY interviews. Often, when employees give notice that they'll be leaving their job, they'll be asked to participate in an exit interview, usually designed to uncover the reasons for the employee's departure and identify any changes that might be made to prevent something similar from happening with other employees in the future. A stay interview takes a more proactive approach. Instead of waiting for an employee to declare their intention to leave, these interviews take place while a person is still in their position. The intent is to gather information about what's important to individual employees and identify things that can be done to maximize the likelihood that they will stay with the organization. In a stay interview, employees are asked not only about the aspects of their job that they'd like to change, but also those aspects that are most meaningful and that they want to keep. Managers then work to address the issues raised in the meeting where possible and follow up with the employee so that they know their input was heard, valued, and is being acted upon. For more details on STAY interviews, see the resource guide for this series. One of the primary responsibilities of a leader is to ensure that the people who report to them are continuously developing their skills and knowledge. Not only is it important so that your team stays up to date on development in their fields, but also because opportunities for growth and development play a major role in employee engagement and retention. The transition to value brings with it a lot of new information, as well as a very different way of looking at healthcare. This means that it's more important than ever to dedicate thought and energy to developing your employees' knowledge and skills. There are many different avenues for doing this. Certainly formal training plays a role in the right circumstances, but there are many additional approaches to development that you may want to consider. In a lot of circumstances, nothing can take the place of learning by doing. When you delegate a task to one of your employees, they have the opportunity to expand their thinking and build new skills, which can lead to feelings of empowerment and being valued. For many leaders, though, delegation is hard. Some have a hard time giving up control or feel that it will take longer to explain rather than just doing it themselves. 
Others are reluctant to put more responsibility on others' plates. Whatever the reason, if you're someone who struggles with delegation, we encourage you to think strategically about delegation. Keep in mind its long-term benefits and the benefits it will bring to the team and the organization over time. Here are a few delegation tips from Harvard Business School. First, know what to delegate. What tasks would help your team develop their confidence and self-sufficiency? What knowledge would give someone a potential career boost? Second, play to your employees' strengths and goals. Think about tasks or projects that would support an individual employee's interests, skills, or career goals. For employees capable of doing more than what they're currently doing, consider giving stretch assignments, defined as a project or task beyond an employee's current knowledge or skills, with the goal of pushing them a bit beyond their comfort zone in order to help them learn and grow. Third, define the desired outcome. Before handing off projects or tasks, be sure the employee knows what good looks like. What are they responsible for achieving and by when? Fourth, provide the right resources and level of authority. Make sure that the employee has the information, equipment, and other resources needed to get the job done. Clarify with them the decisions they can make on their own and when they should consult with you first. Fifth, establish a clear communication channel. Agree on a schedule for checking in and the best way for the employee to get questions answered. Plan to provide feedback and coaching along the way as needed. Sixth, allow for failure. As we learn, we make mistakes. This is expected. Show understanding when mistakes are made and frame them as learning opportunities. And last, give credit where it's due. Once the task or project is complete, be sure that the employee is credited for its success. Delegation is very difficult, um, especially when you don't have trust with a staff member. So what I try to do for myself is I find somebody that I trust um, or I build some trust with that person and then I start to delegate small things, things that in the scheme of things is very small. Um, and then, you know, if they excel, if they, they like it, they're like, hey, you know, I'm, you know, I'm glad that I'm doing this, you know, do you have more? And once you've got that trust with that person, it's, I find it's easier to give them smaller things and smaller things until you feel like, hey, I could actually give this person a big project and, and they would do well. I think, you know, just really making sure as me as a leader giving advice to another leader about delegation, making sure that your, the person who you're assigning that work to understands that it's okay and that you're here to help them. Um, you know, you know, kind of let them kind of take the lead and take the charge and, you know, maybe give a few suggestions. Um, it's been easier for me because I, I just really have a great group of employees who are easy to jump in and want to grab, grab tasks and do things. Um, and so I can see how that would be difficult for some departments who maybe don't have as much time to be able to um, assign those tasks out to people, but start small. Um, start with something that doesn't, isn't going to rock the boat too much and um, get little small successful wins in your delegation and things. Um, and then that will just kind of spark, spark people to continue to keep moving forward. Coaching is another valuable tool in your talent development toolkit. Coaching involves providing an employee with guidance intended to help them develop in their role and in their career. The goals of a leader coach are to facilitate learning, build capacity, expand thinking, work on real life issues, and develop supportive relationships. Coaching isn't the same as training. It's not necessarily about giving people the right answers. It's about helping them think through a situation and decide on a course of action. We increase others' capacity when we help them develop their critical thinking and decision-making skills that will help them become more effective and independent in their role. The most effective coaches keep two critical principles in mind throughout their coaching conversations. The first is that the ownership of the issue rests with the coachee, the person being coached. The second is that a coach's most important role is to listen rather than talk. Coaching is not suited for every situation, particularly when an employee doesn't have the knowledge or skills needed to address the situation at hand. Asking coaching questions will not, for example, help an employee learn how to use Excel or follow a new procedure. But when you feel an employee has the ability to address the situation at hand, but may not have the confidence or the motivation to handle it themselves, coaching can be a great talent development tool. So what might a coaching conversation look like? The GROW model provides specific steps for walking through a coaching conversation. 
The letters in GROW stand for goal, what do I want to achieve, reality, where do things stand now, options, how might I get from here to there, and way forward, what's my best course of action. If you use this model as a coach, your job is to help the coachee think through these questions. For example, let's imagine that you manage a team responsible for care coordination. One of your employees comes to you for advice on overcoming a challenge she's having, getting partners to agree on a new workflow. You know this employee is very capable in her role and decide to use this as a coaching opportunity rather than telling her what you would do in this situation. You'd start by asking questions about the goal. Things like, what would you like to have happen? What do you really want to see? Then you'd move to questions about the current reality. What's happening with this right now? What progress toward your goal have you made so far? What's working well and what's not working well? Once you've helped her clarify her goal and have a clear sense of where things currently stand, it's time to start exploring options or different ways that she might be able to reach her goal. You could ask questions like, what are your options? What has worked for you already and how could you do more of that? And if anything was possible, what would you do? And last, help her sort through the options she identified to settle on her next steps, the way forward. Questions you could ask include things like, of the options you've identified, which are best for moving you towards your goal? What do you have to do to make it happen? What roadblocks might you encounter along the way? And what resources do you need? See the resource guide for a full list of questions you can use at each step in the GROW model. If you've never had a conversation like this with your employees, you might initially encounter resistance because they're expecting you to give them the right answer. But if you do it consistently over time in the right circumstances, you'll see your employees lean into this more collaborative way of problem solving, and you'll build their skills and their confidence in the process. And sometimes I think that employees don't necessarily see that they have growth potential um, and being able to kind of recognize those things and then even just kind of throwing it out, out there to them and being like, no, I think you can do this. And I, and I really would like it if you could try. Um, they usually aren't super resistant. You know, I mean, there's, there's different moments where people are hesitant. I mean, I, you know, one employee is like, I just don't really like speaking in front of a lot of people. You know, I'm like, okay, well, what's the best way to get, get through that? Keep trying, right? And do it again and do it again. And, and you'll find that it becomes easier over time. I believe the biggest thing that my supervisor does is always comes in with the positive attitude. Uh, she sets the tone for the day uh, with positivity. Um, I've seen in the past where people have set the tone with negativity and it has not made for good day or good rapport amongst the employees. Even when you're having a bad day, you just leave your problems at home and you come in and you work with a positive attitude. And also being very open-minded, I think, is important, too, and uh, which she's great at. Um, listens to us, listens to the employees' needs and wants, um, and doesn't dismiss them. Uh, so that's definitely very important. It makes the employees feel wanted, and it makes them, um, you know, feel like their voice is heard um, and not just in the background. So I, we always keep it professional, and I think that that's the way to go because you never know who's around, you never know um, who's listening. Uh, so we always keep it professional. I also think you should be able to trust your supervisor because I think if you feel like you can't trust your supervisor, um, you, you won't go to them and things won't change or things won't get done because you're too afraid to talk to them. Um, so definitely uh, being trustworthy is a characteristic that she has for sure. Um, I also think it's important as a leader, as her as her supervisor position, um, which she does great, is being able to diffuse situations. Um, in the medical field, you get a lot of uh, different types of situations, whether it be patient-related, um, co-workers, um, insurance. It just, sometimes you just get in, in sticky situations. And I think that being able to diffuse uh, those situations is definitely one of them important aspects um, and being able to do it to help the situation and make everyone happy in the end. Well, we've reached the end of this module and the end of this series. Through the six modules in the series, we explored the fundamentals of value-based care, strategic and systems thinking, collaborative leadership, change leadership, the basics of rural healthcare finance, and talent development. 
You heard from other rural health leaders and hopefully had some valuable discussions with your colleagues. We hope that you leave this program feeling better prepared to lead your team and support your organization through the transition to value. For more tools and resources to help you in this transition, check out our website. We have a Rural Hospital Toolkit for Transitioning to Value-Based Systems and a leadership collection full of great tools and information. We at the National Rural Health Resource Center are always available to answer questions or provide any additional resources. Please contact us anytime for further assistance. We sincerely thank you for joining us throughout this series and we wish you the best as you continue your important work in rural health. If you expect any upcoming job openings in your department, take some time to think carefully about what this position might look like in the next three to five years. Will more collaboration be required in this job in a new healthcare environment? New technology or interpersonal skills? How might you ensure that you hire the person who's right for the next iteration of this job? If you were to leave your position tomorrow, who would replace you? Do you have someone ready in the wings? Or would this person need to be developed if you were to promote from within? Who might be the right successor? And what skills and knowledge would they need? And if there really isn't anyone who might fill your shoes, how might you keep these concepts in mind the next time you fill a position in your department? Consider having a conversation with your direct supervisor about succession planning. Does your organization engage in any succession planning activities? If you don't know the answer to this question, talk to your human resources department to learn more. Are STAY interviews performed regularly in your organization? If not, you might want to ask your human resources department for their thoughts and consider implementing them in your department. And here are a few things for you to consider doing. Watch the 12 minute TEDx video, Confessions of a Recovering Micromanager, to hear one leader's entertaining and insightful personal story about learning to delegate. Identify potential tasks and projects that could be delegated to others. Plan your approach carefully, following Harvard Business School guidelines, and ask a peer or mentor for guidance if delegation isn't something you do on a regular basis. And be on the lookout for opportunities to have coaching conversations. Use the Grow Coaching Questions handout included in the resource guide to help you plan these conversations. For additional information and resources on any of the topics covered in this module, see the resource guide that accompanies this program. And of course, please feel free to contact us at the center anytime for additional support. And we have a request. We need your feedback. On the main webpage dedicated to this series, there's a Give Feedback link. At any time during the course of this series, or even multiple times, please go to our website and share what was valuable for you and any suggestions you have for making this series better. We thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to continuing the conversation over the next few months.